So good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, today we begin our fifth day uh, and fortunately or unfortunately last day of the of this meeting of the 12th meeting of studies on the origins of contemporary philosophy and today we have two very special guests uh our keynote speaker is Lydia Payton professor at Virginia Tech and she will debate her presentation with Mauro Engelman a long friend of our research group um so Lydia the floor is yours you can begin when you will Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And I really want to thank um, Dr. Engelmann and uh, Bruno Poli and Mario Gonzalez Porta for, um, for the invitation and for the ability to uh, give this talk. And unfortunately not, in fact, in Brazil, but uh, hopefully next year <laughs> we'll all be able to meet. Um, and but I am glad that that uh, this is able to be available online. So that's an excellent thing. Um, so the if excellent. I'm waiting for the slides to be live. But so let me just say something while I um, while we're waiting for the slides to be loaded. Um, what I'm going to be talking about in the paper, which I'm going to start reading in a moment, um, is the evolution of thinking about philosophical naturalism and how I think it was influenced um, by developments in psychology in the 19th century. And I'm also going to be talking about different ways of thinking about naturalism and in particular different ways of thinking about naturalism about the subject. Um, so if we could advance the slide at this point, thank you. And then uh, one more, please. Thanks. So um, philosophical naturalism became a mainstream view in philosophy over the 20th century. So the next slide, please. So uh, Chan in 2021 has given what uh, is called a disciplinary characterization of metaphysical naturalism. In other words, the characterization that's given in professional philosophy, that every entity or property instantiated in the actual world is natural in the sense of being a posited entity or property of the natural sciences, or being exclusively constituted by these posited entities or properties. Um, this is the definition that's frequently used in contemporary analytic philosophy, more or less, and that's what it's intended to be. Uh, the next slide, please. And Hugh Price in 2007 has given a slightly different definition, but, but consistent in many ways. Scientific naturalism is a metaphysical doctrine. It's a view about what there is or what we ought to believe that there is. It maintains that natural science should be our guide in matters metaphysical. The ontology we should accept is the ontology that turns out to be required by science. These definitions build in a characterization of science as the epistemic activity most likely to discover and to explain the entities and the events of the natural world. But naturalism arises in multiple philosophical contexts, including metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology. Robert Audi has pointed out recently that if there's a unifying conception of naturalism in all these domains, it is at least not commonly made clear. <laughs> um, and the aim of this section will not be to find a unifying conception of naturalism, that would be far too much to try to do, but rather to clarify how epistemic naturalism in particular became preeminent in the 20th century. And then in the section following, we'll investigate its relationship with psychology. Um, and then the final section will be wild speculation in some ways. Um, epistemic naturalism is a characterization of knowledge, and this is on the next slide, sorry, as fundamentally explainable in scientific terms, but also, and this is key, as arising through a natural physical process. So knowledge as arising through physical processes rather than ideal ones. If our epistemic activities are physical, then characterizing the knower as a natural physical being becomes central to naturalist epistemology. So epistemic naturalism has two aspects, naturalism about knowledge and about the knower. 
On a naturalist understanding then, we might say, science is a reliable process of generating knowledge and epistemic subjects are reliable trackers of that knowledge. Several related but distinct trends in epistemic naturalism developed over the late 19th and early 20th century. And the next slide. One is a form of behaviorism that's found in the work of John B. Watson, B.F. Skinner, Willard Van Orman Quine, and Gilbert Ryle in The Concept of Mind. According to this view, language, reference, and much or all of the process of coming to know something are social processes. They're a kind of behavior. Here, truth is a correspondence, not between propositions and the world, but between stimuli and responses. And this is a quote, um, sorry, I'm missing the first uh, quotation mark on the slide. Truth as the strength of correlation between stimulus and response is the best behavioral surrogate for the semantic notion of truth. And this is from a 2012 paper by Don Howard. And then next slide. A second naturalist account springs from neutral monism, which is found in the work of Ernst Mach, Bertrand Russell, and William James. Neutral monism involves the view that only one substance exists and that there's nothing intrinsic that distinguishes, for instance, mental from physical substance. Eric Banks has argued that along with neutral monism, James, Mach, and Russell share a realistic empiricism. According to this view, science is the best description of the events and causal functional relations which make up the natural world. And thus science is the gold standard of knowledge about the world. Learning about the knower or the subject is simply a special case of learning about the mechanisms of the natural world according to realistic empiricism. So here the knower is just one of the many causal functional mechanisms at work in the world and we learn about it in the same way that we learn about all the other ones. Hence, realistic empiricism is a naturalist position not only about knowledge itself, but about the knower. So the next slide, it's the controversial one. Um, a third account that, and I want to be very careful here, that contributes to the development of philosophical naturalism, though at times in a critical way, is found in the work of the logical empiricists, especially Rudolf Carnap, Hans Reichenbach, Moritz Schlick, and Otto Neurath. So it's not right to count the views of all of the logical empiricists as naturalist, right? And so there are readings of um, Neurath, for instance, by Thomas Ubel that read him as naturalist, that's straightforward. Um, but for instance, Carnap maintained a strong a priori element in his thinking and a form of the analytic synthetic distinction as is well known, at least for a long time, both of which are often considered antithetical to naturalism. Quine's two dogmas of empiricism is sometimes taken along with epistemology naturalized to first establish a naturalist epistemology and second to refute Carnap's intentionalist theory of meaning and his analytic synthetic distinction. Still, and this is the next slide, the logical empiricists certainly contributed to the development of debates over the role of science in knowledge, that's clear, and at least three of their well-known commitments in this, on this score are relevant. The first is well known, their opposition to traditional metaphysics. The second is the view that knowledge is coextensive with scientific explanation, that science is a way of describing what there is. Carnap's essay, The Elimination of Metaphysics Through Logical Analysis of Language from 1932 is a brilliant synthesis of these two views. The third commitment is to physicalism, the view that everything there is, is physical. So one definition of physicalism is that it's a position that, and this is a quote from Thomas Ubel, it accords primacy to the physical language, declaring it to be the only universal language such that all other languages can be translated into it. The view that everything is physical involves the belief that all meaningful statements can be translated into the physical language, and physical language is the language of the natural sciences. Section two following will lay out one source of disagreement over naturalism, the spectacular results of 19th century theories of perception. These theories united physiology, psychology, and epistemology 
to detail a scientific account of perception and objective knowledge. Section three will sketch an interpretation of Carnap's, uh, Carnap's Aufbau as continuous with the 19th century tradition described in section two. And it will conclude by arguing that it's likely that Carnap's early work is related to discussions emerging from 19th century psychology. And that if we read the work in that way, it can be illuminating on at least some questions. So the next slide, um, and this is section two, 19th century theories of perception. Um, and the subtitle is inference and the subjective. So next slide. So the incredible research done into the physiology and psychology of perception in the 19th century has two specific aspects that will be relevant to what we'll be talking about. The first is that it takes physiology and psychology to be continuous and related. So here physiology is the study of the physical or, or corporeal um, processes that are going on in the body. Um, and psychology is of course the study of the mind or soul where that's very complicated uh, what, what is meant by the soul. But in, in other words, the idea behind this research tradition is that there's no in principle distinction between research into physiology and research into psychology. You have to kind of make that distinction in practice. Second, the analysis of perception is continuous with epistemology. Epistemic activities, especially inference, aren't distinct from perception. As a result, the physiological and psychological analysis of how perception comes about isn't considered to be essentially separate from an analysis of how we come to have knowledge of objects in the world. Partly as a result of these commitments, there's a contemporary assumption about the science of psychology that doesn't really apply, in my opinion, to work from the 19th century. And this is on the next slide, I think. That assumption is that psychology is about mental activity and especially about voluntary mental activity. In other words, the assumption is that we kind of just automatically make is that psychology is the science of thinking. And in contrast, neuroscience or physiology analyzes the operations of the brain and the nervous system. There are two reasons that this is inaccurate. The first is that during the 19th century, what we now call psychology included scientific explanation, uh, sorry, scientific investigation into perceptual phenomena. How we come to have perceptual experiences involving hearing, sight, smell, taste, or touch. As we'll see during the 19th century, most Western scientists, and this is the next slide, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, most Western scientists investigated these phenomena as combining the operations of the mind with the operations of the body, including the nervous system. This was done through a robust connection between psychology, again, and the physiology of perception. So much of what we consider to be part of the history of psychology involves physiological research into the nervous and sensory systems in this 19th century tradition. So the next slide then. The second reason that even is that uh, this assumption um, about psychology involving only voluntary mental activity is inaccurate is that even some inferences that were ascribed to the mind during the 19th century were involuntary in a way that's analogous to physical reactions. So uh, this is a quote from Gary Hatfield's book, The Natural and the Normative, which will come up later as well. Um, physio sorry, psychological explanation could include, quote, whatever operations are believed to mediate between the sensations produced by physiological processes and the final perceptual experience. Thus, psychology didn't need to be conceived as a science of operations of the mind external to the perception of external entities and events, right? So um, psychology didn't need to be seen as a kind of black box operating separately from how we interact with the outside world. 
It was a type of scientific explanation continuous with the other sciences involved in perception, including the rich research being done into the physiology of perception. So both psychology and physiology were connected with epistemology in the work of the, many of the 19th century figures that we'll be discussing. Over the 19th century, the science of responses of sensory nerves to stimuli became an increasingly rich area of exploration. And I think uh, we should go to the next slide at this point. Oh, well, we will, we'll, we'll stay there, but it'll take us a minute to get there, <laughs> sorry. Um, Johannes Müller, Ewald Herring, Franziskus Donders, Ernst Weber, Gustav Fechner, and many others invested the react investigated the reactions of sensory nerves to stimuli. So the increasing sophistication of accounts of sensory perception only made it more evident that our visual, auditory, and haptic perceptions appear more complex than can be explained by appeal to such responses alone. Simple linear combinations of responses of nerves to, sing, uh, to single stimuli do not add up to a satisfying explanation of perceptual complexity, of the perception of compound notes in chords, of the shades of light on leaves, or of depth of field. So the idea is um, initially we might think that being able to investigate um, stimulus response curves or just single um, sensory responses to single stimuli um, can explain perceptual complexity. It's just that we need to combine um, those responses to explain complexity. But um, in fact, one of, the, uh, one of the problems that became clear in this research tradition is that we need to investigate whether perception involves psychology as well as physiology. So in other words, whether there's a mental component um, to perception itself. So it's not the case that there's a perception that's happening um, in our sensory system or in physiology, and then the mind weighs in later um, with inference. There might be inference involved in perception and this blurs the boundaries um, that I've been talking about in this section. So the role of inference in perception came to the forefront. These discussions have their roots and a moment of history for a second in an earlier tradition of studies of perception. So the second chapter of Gary Hatfield's The Natural and the Normative, which came out in 1990, um, begins with a discussion of 16th and 17th century theories of perception according to which perception has three stages, physical, physiological, and psychological. These early modern theories provide two, and I'm quoting from Hatfield, two types of explanation for the phenomenal content of a sensory idea. Psychophysical, which, and this is a quote from Hatfield again, which appeals only to the immediate effects of physiological processes upon the mind. And then secondly, psychological. The psychological explanations mediate between sensory content and perceptual experience. One of the focuses of this type of discussion is the fact that there are significant disparities, for instance, in visual perception between visual experience and the retinal image. The perception of size and distance is a crucial difference between the retinal image and phenomenal experience, which became a central problem for 18th and 19th century theories. The ordering of the nerve fibers in the optic nerve and the order in which light strikes the retina determine what's given sensibly, the sensory given as Hatfield calls it. But Hatfield observes that the sensory given is not the quote, final product of the perceptual process. That final product is visual experience or perceptual experience in general. The question of how the sensory given is worked up into perceptual experience became fundamental to research in physiology and psychology. And now we finally get to the slide that's on the screen. <laughs> um, Hermann von Helmholtz's scientific investigations into perception are presented in two landmark works. The Handbook of Physiological Optics and on the Sensations of Tone. Um, Helmholtz had other books, but these were among the most, uh, the most important and the, 
the heaviest. Um, in these texts, Helmholtz develops an account which connects the lawfulness and determinacy of the relationship between the subjective manifold of sensations and perceptions and experience and the inferred properties of the external stimuli that occasion those sensations and perceptions. Um, this account can be found in section 26 of the physiological optics on perceptions in general. So we can advance the slide. Yeah, this is the handbook of physiological optics. And I've given you two pictures of Helmholtz. The one on the last slide was young Helmholtz and the one of course on the left is the more venerable Helmholtz. And at the right is the, um, his portable ophthalmoscope that he uh, presented in the handbook. So the next slide. Yeah. In section 26 of the physiological optics, um, Helmholtz outlines a theory according to which sensible experience involves inference. When we perceive objects as colored, as having a taste or a smell, or as occupying a certain place in space, this involves inductive inferences from previous experience. One is that the perceived color, taste, or smell is associated with an object at a distinct place in space from the subject. Other inferences involve judgments of distance and depth based on sensory information, which are evident in our perceptual experience. For instance, we perceive objects that are farther away as smaller. Uh, this is a known fact about perceptual experience. For a fuller account of the role of the causal law in Helmholtz's account of perception, we can look at his analysis in the theory of visual perceptions, which is the psychological part of the book. And the next slide, please. Yeah. Helmholtz concludes in this section that the distinction between the subjective and the objective in perception is an empirical question one that's constitutively influenced by a physiological account of the sensory apparatus and its role in perception. The physiological account is then the basis in Helmholtz of epistemological judgments, including the famous question from the facts in perception, which is a, uh, an address that Helmholtz gave earlier. What is truth in our representations? To Helmholtz, we can identify which parts of sensation depend on the object and which on the sensory apparatus of the subject. And can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Right. But this requires specifying quite clearly the range and sensitivity of the subjective side of sensation and perception. Identifying the objective in our experience requires a detailed account of the subjective. In this sense, Helmholtz extends Kant's reasoning according to which we must specify the subjective conditions of knowledge in order to gain a secure ground for that knowledge. But unlike Kant, Helmholtz argues that these subjective conditions are in part physiological and in part inferential. We can investigate the properties and reactions of our physiological sensory capacities to fill out our picture of the subjective side of perception we learn from experience what's contributed by entities and events. Uh, the next slide, please. Oh, okay, we'll stop. We'll, again, we'll work up to this slide. <laughs> um, solving the puzzle of what's subjective and what's objective in our perceptions for Helmholtz requires determining which components of our experience are effects of external causes, but nonetheless, and this is a quote from Helmholtz, belong only to our nervous system, and which elements in fact, quote, extend to external space. So this is a question that goes back to the work of uh, Al Haytham and Galileo. What does our sensory system contribute to perception and what's contributed by the object or event that we're observing? Helmholtz's epistemological project is based on an account of how we arrive at objective knowledge on the basis of sensation and inference, invested, investigated through physiology, psychology, physics, and philosophy. There's a key point in this approach. Showing what's objective in our perception and thus acquiring knowledge of objects 
paradoxically requires a richer account of the subject, including the subject's reactions to stimuli and inferences the subject may draw in response to experience of objects. In the 20th century, questions that were treated as continuous with each other in the 19th century were carefully drawn apart. One of the key distinctions in 20th century analytic philosophy, which is our topic, um, is that between is, is a distinction between the contributions to knowledge of inference or conceptual reasoning and of sensation. But in the 19th century and at the very beginning of the 20th century, it was still possible to treat these as inference and sensation as working together in the construction of the world. As I'll argue in the section following, the conception of how sensation, perception, and inference work together, found in the 19th century tradition that I've been looking at, had a crucial inference, in, influence, sorry, had a crucial influence on the development of 20th century theories of the subject of knowledge. And so now we do get to the conclusion, the concluding section. So the next slide, thanks. Naturalism involves, as we talked about earlier, involves taking the explanations of the natural sciences as definitive of the entities and events that make up the world we inhabit, or at least epistemic naturalism does so. But it matters quite a bit what we mean by the natural sciences and how we conceive of the person who interacts with those sciences. For many scientifically minded philosophers in the 20th century, knowledge should involve a true interaction between the knower and other objects in the world, or even the denial of a fundamental difference between knowledge of each. The rejection of idealism in metaphysics sometimes came to involve a rejection of any fundamental rift between internal and external, subject and object. So naturalism comes to encompass basic positions on self-knowledge and the closely related question of the involvement of the external world in subjective beliefs and the dependence of the latter on the former, which came to be known as externalism. And now we come to the material on the slide. Externalism about belief often goes hand in hand with a position on the subject as an essentially natural being. The argument goes something like this. Naturalism must involve a position according to which the subject is not essentially separate from nature. The knower, like the known, is a part of nature. Idealist and supernaturalist or theological approaches remove the subject from nature to an ideal, rational, or divine plane, separating her from the world. But that's to get it fundamentally wrong. The subject not only is part of nature, but her beliefs and knowledge depend on nature and on her engagement with it. In what follows, we will focus on a specific aspect of epistemic naturalism that a naturalist account of knowledge requires a naturalist explanation of the role of the epistemic subject. Here, a complexity arises that we'll start by, by looking at, namely that there are quite a few distinct methods in philosophy, including in early 20th century philosophy, of accounting for the subject of knowledge in the first place. And this is the next slide. And then the next one, sorry. Okay. One way of accounting for the epistemic subject is physicalist. That characterizes the subject interactions and experiences as part of the causal functional nexus of physical events. One specific variant of this approach is evolutionary naturalism, where knowledge and science are analyzed as specific results of biological processes of evolution. Um, and I note, I want to note historically that there's an interesting fact about this. Um, arguably, and this is somewhat controversial in a couple of these cases, Ernst Mach, John Dewey, and Roy Wood, Wood Sellers all took this tack. But it's also true that the neo-Kantian Alois Real can be seen as taking a version of this position. So it's a very interesting and complex position to take the evolutionary naturalism view. And then the next slide. 
Another way to account for the subject of knowledge is constitution, showing how beliefs and knowledge arise in a subject through a process that can be analyzed scientifically. I want to emphasize that this analysis of constitution can be naturalist or not. Um, James, Mach, and Carnap all appeal to some form of constitution process, although in different ways. One aspect of the constitutional method is a logical or inferentialist approach, which is found in many of these thinkers, um, which identifies the steps in reasoning and observation that an epistemic subject must take in order to arrive at some result. And then the next slide. So yet another path to explaining the epistemic subject, and this, um, this will hark back to the first section where we were talking about different kinds of naturalism, um, is the social or behaviorist method for accounting for subjective reasoning, where the subject is seen as engaging in public reasoning in a way that's socially constituted and interpreted. And many of the same figures I mentioned in the first section are going to have theories along these lines, um, Quine, uh, Watson, Skinner. Thus, there are at least three general ways of describing the subject of knowledge that became relevant to the process, uh, to the project, sorry, of epistemology. Physicalism, constitution, and social or behaviorist explanation. As can be seen from some of the examples that I've given, many thinkers will combine one or more of the approaches to explanation of the subject. Carnap combines physicalist, constitutional, and even social reasoning, arguably, and Mach and James employ both physicalist and constitutional approaches. Despite their many similarities, Quine emphasizes the behavioral and logical aspects of subjective reasoning and Dewey the social and evolutionary aspects. These categories are not exhaustive, nor are the classifications I've listed above intended to be absolute. Dewey appeals to logic and Carnap appeals to social factors and that's fine. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? But my aim in setting out these distinctions is twofold. First, to demonstrate that what it means to give an account of the epistemic subject is much more complex than it may initially seem, and what, especially what it means to give a naturalist or physicalist or behaviorist account. And second, to show that two accounts of the epistemic subject may not have very much in common. And so just to uh, say a bit more about that, um, the second point is quite significant because it's behind many of the conflicts that occur over the 20th century over knowledge in general. For instance, some physicalist approaches emphasize incorporating the epistemic subject into the causal functional nexus as described by the natural physical sciences, but wouldn't accept social or behavioral accounts of the subject as scientific. Meanwhile, some accounts are based on logic as a science that describes however formally the actions of reasoners but some would reject the credentials of the logical account as a full explanation of the epistemic subject because it reduces the knower to a mere inferential reasoner. And so it's not substantive enough on that account. The seminal discussions between Carnap and Quine in the 20th century are characteristic in some ways of the differences between the above approaches. Before discussing this, it's worth noting recent scholarship that emphasizes common ground between Carnap and Quine. Gary Ebbs in his 2017 book uh, provides a full account of the common ground between Carnap and Quine on scientific inquiry. And as Alexander Klein has remarked recently, um, Quine's naturalism, despite its opposition to Carnapian rational reconstruction, and this is a quote from Klein, tacitly retains one of logical positivism's crucially anti-pragmatist commitments, that philosophy of science should focus exclusively on the context of justification and not on the context of discovery. On Klein's reading, despite the fact that Quine had a substantive theory of psychology, it was used in the service of justification, not discovery, and Quine and Carnap have this in common. However, there are undeniable differences, as Quine and Carnap recognize themselves, and one of them is highlighted by Quine in Epistemology Naturalized. 
By Quine's standards, the knowing subject that's implicit in Carnap's Aufbau and in empiricism, semantics, and ontology, so throughout Carnap's career, is too thinly characterized. Of course, he didn't say the second one in epistemology naturalized. Carnap doesn't require any access to a supernatural or rationalist source of knowledge or reasoning, and he's well known for rejecting metaphysical accounts of the subject and of knowledge in general. He's even positively committed to physicalism about the subject, or at least so one can argue. On the other hand, Carnap doesn't begin from any particular account of the knowing subject, arguably. The subject is simply the being who's capable of having certain experiences, carrying out inferences, and so on. Thus, Carnap arguably doesn't have any prior commitment to the human subject as having specific properties or dispositions, for instance, social or behavioral characteristics. According to Quine, at least in some of his criticisms, while Carnap rules out non-naturalist accounts of the subject, he may not himself have a comprehensive theory of the knowing subject. And can we go to the next slide? So I'm a little, yep, I was worried about that, that I was missing something that I should have put up. Yeah, so these are the texts that we'll be talking about. So according to Quine, while Carnap rules out non-naturalist accounts of the subject, um, he may not, Carnap may not himself have a comprehensive theory of the knowing subject based on a specific scientific description of the subject's natural capacities. So can we go to the next slide? Thanks. As one would predict, um, knowing Carnap's later uh, commitments, it seems in the Aufbau that Carnap is committed to pluralism about subjective past to, to knowledge. Quine's behaviorism might be one of them, but Carnap wouldn't rule out other paths. Nonetheless, Carnap's project early on, including in the Aufbau, was more in line with the significant achievements of the 19th century that we've been talking about than one might think. And here I'm, I'm with some trepidation going to wade into uh, some of the discussions about the Aufbau. I think that if you really want to learn about the Aufbau, um, Alan Richardson's 1997 book and Chris Pinkock's recent 2000, well, 2009 essay um, are good places to look. Nonetheless, I will try to say some things that are relatively uncontroversial. Um, so first, the first of those is that Carnap's aim in the first part of the Aufbau is to explain how scientific knowledge can be, and this is a quote from Pincock's essay, objective despite its origins in subjective experiences, or what Carnap calls the auto-psychological basis. But the crux of the system is in how perceptual experience and knowledge of objects are built up from elementary experiences. And in particular, and this is a puzzle that uh, many people have pointed out, or a number of people have pointed out, Carnap's constitutional system is intended to reflect the order in which people actually come to know something about objects. And the next slide, please. There's a tension between Carnap's goal of recreating the order subjects actually follow in constituting knowledge and the lack, or at least if Quine is to believe, be believed, of his own substantive theory of psychology in the Aufbau. If psychology is the science that explains how people think, then doesn't Carnap need a theory of psychology in order to explain, in order to demonstrate that his constitutional system captures the actual order of epistemic inference? So if he's going to make a claim that these are the real uh, epistemic steps that someone takes, um, then doesn't he need to have some kind of uh, scientific account of how that's going to happen? Now, of course, there are numerous ways that Carnap could respond to this um, objection or, or noting of attention. Um, and the first is, and can we advance the slide, I think? Yeah. The first is that Carnap doesn't stop with the constitutional system that's built up from the auto-psychological. He continues in the third part of the Aufbau to analyze how subjective systems are coordinated to make up an intersubjective world. Intersubjectivity, the basis of public and social reasoning, is not given but constituted. Rather than beginning from a theory of psychology and building up a theory of inference from there, we might argue that in the Aufbau, Carnap lets the necessary and sufficient conditions for constructing a publicly accessible world determine the epistemic order. 
And one reason that we might think that to be the case is that objectivity in the alphabet is essentially connected to intersubjectivity. This is something he says in section 66. So the next slide. The second response is that we might think that Carnap's approach in the Aufbau was more informed by the tradition of 19th century research detailed above than you might think. In that tradition, the work of reasoning and inference in perception may not be the result of voluntary or arbitrary choice on the part of the subject. Helmholtz, for instance, argues that inferences from previous experience shape one's current perceptual experience and even influence the judgments one draws from that experience. The objection to Carnap's account depends on the assumption that if Carnap doesn't choose some substantive psychological theory, and I think this is the next slide, yeah, to explain how the subject arrives at perceptual experience and objective knowledge, then there's a gap between the auto-psychological and the constitution system. This involves a further assumption that there's more than one general way to get from the auto-psychological to the constitution of perceptual experience and of objective knowledge. But if the ground level inferences and reasoning that go into the constitution of the world are not chosen, but rather are brute facts about how subject living in a world like ours must respond to it in arriving at perceptual experience and objective knowledge, then this objection loses its force. So I'm not arguing that Carnap was a follower of Helmholtz and Fechner and Weber in his analysis of perception. Um, I, I honestly don't think that would be terribly implausible, but there are lots of ways in which we might find differences. But I'm making the more minimal claim that if we understand psychology in the way Helmholtz, Fechner, and Weber do, Carnap's arguments in the Aufbau are less subject to the objection raised above that there's a tension um, between his claims in the text. So in closing, I want to sketch a possible way to characterize Carnap's approach using the tools of 19th century psychology. And of necessity, this will be brief, but I hope it will be suggest suggestive. So the first thing is that it's important to take into account Carnap's larger project. One of his main aims is to distinguish between constitutive and substantive claims by finding a way to precisely delimit which is which in the language of science. And this is from uh, this uh, text that I'm citing is Alan Richardson's essay, Two Dogmas About Logical Empiricism. Um, he's not responsible for any of the claims I make in this paper, except this one, um, which is a quote. Carnap may even be taken to argue that, quote, and this is from Gary Ebbs, same disclaimer, <laughs> Um, our only grip on truth or falsity is given by explicitly adopted rules for evaluating sentences. And this is one of the claims that Quine explicitly rejects and one of the points that's usually raised in um, talking about the distinction between Carnap and Quine and the debates between them. But whether this last claim is accurate of Carnap depends on how it's read. And that claim is our only grip on truth or falsity is given by explicitly adopted rules for evaluating sentences. So there's one way of reading this according to which it's obviously true for Carnap. Um, and then the next slide, sorry. Um, however, it depends on how we read this claim. So it's certainly true that for Carnap, a bare report of sensation is not enough to hold a truth value. I think that's at least something that, that's beyond dispute. But it's not enough to say that Carnap first adopts conventionalism about semantic rules, and secondly, argues that these conventional rules alone determine truth and falsity. In other words, determine what's objectively true or false. To understand why that would be insufficient, or at least in the way that I think about this now, um, think about the project of the Aufbau. Three quarters of the book would be beside the point if these two projects exhausted Carnap's account. The explicit delineation of semantic rules requires an account of how objects are built up from the auto-psychological. The constitutive and the substantive depend on each other. Convention alone doesn't determine truth any more than direct sensory observation does. And I may be pressed on this later, but I want to just say quickly that I think um, it's not that, well, never mind. 
I'll, I'll stop there just in case uh, we want to discuss this later. So for Carnap, or so I would urge, the semantic content of science tracks the actual relations and inferences involved in the construction of a world from the auto-psychological. So obviously this is just the alpha, I'm not trying to make a sweeping claim. Um, so the next slide, please. Yeah, these relations and constructions are not arbitrarily chosen, but rather are imposed on the subject by the requirements for building a world of experience and arriving at objective knowledge from the material presented to her in observation. Carnap's early semantic theory is entangled with the logical and epistemological requirements for objective knowledge. In arriving at judgments about objects, we arrive at the entirety of the knowledge that we can have about the external world. And so then we have this lovely um, quote from the task of the logic of science. Everything that can be said about things is said by science or more specifically by the special branch of science that deals with the corresponding domain of things. There's nothing else, there's nothing higher to be said about things than what science says about them. Rather, the object of the logic of science is science itself as an ordered complex of sentences. Read in this way, Carnap's project does provide a robust account of the epistemic subject. The subject's ability to constitute a world of objects and events depends on engagement with the world. That activity of constitution follows an epistemic order that's not the result of arbitrary volition on the part of the subject, but rather follows a structure that, again, requires engagement with things. Science describes the structure and character of the subject's engagement with things and consequent construction of a world of experience. So in closing, I just want to say something very quickly about how this discussion relates to what I said earlier in the paper, and then I will finish. Um, so I just want to say that um, the different accounts of naturalism that were presented earlier were then refined into the accounts of naturalism about the epistemic subject. And one of the criticisms that uh, was leveled against um, non-naturalist accounts of the epistemic subject was that they didn't provide sufficient engagement with the external world, right? They were not sufficiently externalist. Or, they, or as Quine argued about Carnap, there wasn't a sufficiently strong account of the subject of knowledge and her um, activities. And one of the points that I wanted to make in going through Carnap's project about the Aufbau was in, in the Aufbau, was not simply to provide a reading of that project, but also to argue that there can be an account that doesn't meet um, the requirements of some particular kind of epistemic naturalism, um, or that doesn't meet the requirements of some particular account of how philosophy and science um, should be related, but that nonetheless um, provides a substantive account of the subject of knowledge and that is even um, quite continuous with research that was being done in the 19th century into psychology and the physiology of perception. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks. So thank you, thank you for the great presentation. I think there's uh, some echo, so. Thank you, Lydia, for the great presentation. Um, we now begin a debate which will be conduced by Mauro Engelman. So, Mauro, when you will. Thank you. And, of course, thank you very much for the, um, the paper. Um, now, um, the paper is very instigating, I think. Um, Patton proposes, in, the, in my view, a new interpretation of the goals in the background of Carnap's Aufbau. So the Aufbau is presented as a kind of naturalist project grounded in, the, in 19th century epistemology, particularly in the work of Helmholtz. It is argued that the project of the Aufbau uh, 
emerges from the 19th century naturalism and not only gestalt psychology. So, I'm not sure if I grasped correctly details of the arguments of the paper, and I hope that answers to my comments and questions will help me to get a clearer view of Patton's views on naturalism, Carnap, and Helmholtz. Now, there is a common strategy part, partially applied in Patton's paper that consists in distancing the Aufbau from Russell's constructive project in the dualism phase of our knowledge of the external world and in the monist phase of the analysis of mind. Russell's constructive empiricist project as Carnap's is derived from the major ideas of reduction grounded in, in his type theory logicism, which exemplifies a reduction in the case of mathematics. Recently, new Carnap like Friedman and Richardson, for instance, try to distance Carnap from Russell's empiricism with the idea that the basis for the construction of the world is not necessarily a basis of sensations, images, sense data, and the like. Indeed, Carnap mentions years later in a new preface that a different basis could have been chosen. And in paragraph 59 of the Alba, he already suggests a materialist reduction as an alternative to his epistemic reduction. However, the fact is that Carnap chose solipsistic elementary experiences as the ground for construction in the output, which he took to be metaphysically neutral. And I will come back to the relevance of this point later claims in the Aufbau that a materialistic basis would not correspond to the epistemic order of things. He says we can only know about the physical by means of the given. I have the impression, and here is my general worry concerning the paper, that the 19th century scientific basis argued by Python is a new effort that changes somewhat Carnap's own early goals. Patton's strategy might be more fruitful than previous ones, for it uses the historical development of science that was certainly relevant in the context in which Carnap wrote the alphabet. However, I'm still not completely convinced that this strategy succeeds. So in what follows, I will point out some concerns about this strategy. Naturalism can be understood in many ways, as Patton argues. However, this makes the use of the word outside a very specific context. For instance, just the debate kind of coin, very difficult. If one has a more restricted view of naturalism as the one presented in the abstract of the paper, namely naturalism as the position that the limits of philosophy should be the boundaries of scientific explanation, one might exclude Ryle, who is a naturalist according to Patton. Moreover, if philosophy is limited by the boundaries of scientific explanation, can Carnap's philosophy in the alphabet provide the constructional foundations of science? Now, if one takes those limits seriously, logical empiricism might not be a form of naturalism, since the foundation of science by means of perception does not look scientific by our standards nowadays. Of course, this might have been the reason why Patton goes back to the 19th century science. On the other hand, now, 19th century science might not be naturalistic physicalistic in the second sense of the word given by Patton. If one sees naturalism as committed to physicalism by assuming that, I quote page three, all meaningful statements can be translated into the physical language, and physical language is the language of the natural sciences, then the number of naturalists mentioned in the paper shrinks too much. One must exclude, it seems, Ryle, Schlick, and Sellers. Moreover, one feels unsure about attributing such a physicalism to Helmholtz, 
though he was interested in explaining the causes of perception, and his project does not seem to reduce them to physiology or physics. Finally, it seems doubtful that the alpha was physicalist. It is true that Carnap was a physicalist in the 30s, as page 4 makes clear, but this does not show that he was a physicalist at the time of the alpha. In fact, he changed his position in the 30s, as he makes clear, in physical language as universal language from 32 and testability and meaning from 36. Passages of Carnap's words quoted in the paper, particularly, well, pages 11 and 12, do not refer to the Aufbau, but to Carnap's later work. I do not see how that is supposed to clarify Carnap's early views in the Aufbau. Those passages suggest physicalism in the 20s, but physicalism becomes Carnap's goal only in the early 30s. So, naturalism is such a broad notion that people have argued that Wittgenstein's philosophy and philosophical investigation is a kind of naturalism. Well, if this is correct, it is certainly not naturalism in any of the senses presented by Patton. Now, although Wittgenstein was certainly an influence on Carnap, a fact that could make his views relevant here, it is clear that Quine's naturalism, for obvious reasons, might offer the best contrast to Carnap's philosophy. So naturalism, in a Quinean sense, is arguably a complete reformulation of empiricism in two fronts. In logic, it breaks with the idea that one must begin with the postulation of any intermediate entities, such as spreading senses, meanings, propositions, and intentions. Now, this is important for discussions of Carnap's philosophy after the Alpha. In epistemology, the most important front here, of course, it breaks with the idea that one must begin with personal experiences, such as elementary experiences, the flow of consciousness, sensations, images, mental contents, and ideas. Both points, I think, are absent in the logic and epistemology of the Alpha. Both points are also absent in some variations that was, were pointed out as naturalism, namely Russell's monism and also William James' monism. Now, the case of epistemology is particularly relevant because the basis for Carnap's construction is elementary experiences. Thus, it seems, whatever the sense of naturalism that one may ascribe to the alpha or the historical background related to the alpha, it is not the Quinean sense of the word that is in question. In the Quinean sense, moreover, neither neutral monism nor logical empiricism is naturalism, but just old empiricism. I wonder if Patton could agree with me in this disposition, and if not, why? My impression is that attributing naturalism to the alpha or to the 19th century German science obliterates an important point in the debate kind of mind and thus introduces an unfair standard for evaluation of this debate. Now, although Cartesianism is assumed by Patton as a kind of antithesis to 19th century naturalistic science, I'm not sure if physiology and psychology from the 19th century is not, in fact, a variation of Cartesianism. Now, if one accepts simply, simply the idea that psychology and physiology are not completely separate investigations, as is argued in the paper, I suspect that Helmholtz is closer to Cartesianism than it might immediately appear. First, Patton's claim that, I quote, the mind and body are not essentially separate is in agreement with Descartes. So, of course, I'm pushing naturalism to just the beginning of modern science, right? So, Descartes claims that the mind is not in the body, like, I quote, the sixth meditation, a sailor in a ship, but that there is a union of body and mind, so that the mind is commingled with it. <laughs> 
his point is that mind and body are distinguishable, but not separated. Second, Descartes would not disagree, I think, with what Patton ascribes to 19th century psychology in this crucial passage of the paper. I quote the paper. The physiological and psychological analysis of how perception comes about is not considered to be essentially separate from the analysis of how we come to have knowledge of objects in the world continuity between in, in the world continuity between physiology and perception. Now, I think Descartes' descriptions of the brain, nerves, and perception based on the dissections at the time are in general agreement with such a claim. However, and now this is interesting for Helmholtz and Descartes, it is true also that Descartes, for Descartes, inferences are distinct from perceptions or sensations. Now, but he, this doesn't mean that some people do not include inferences in perception, but the Cartesian point that they should not do that. This is because error is the result of what Descartes calls judgments. According to Descartes, one can only judge correctly that there are, I quote Descartes, differences, differences in objects corresponding to different perceptions. So it means that there is some kind of cause, or in, cause and effect, so that if I distinguish a different effect, I distinguish a different cause. So it's a minimal claim. But this kind of very, very minimal correspondence does not mean, he claims, that what corresponds to perceptions resemble them. Perceptions are just signs of something external. They are not copies or real images of them. Now, nonetheless, I think that Helmholtz agrees with Descartes, as the following quoted passage seems to attest. attest sorry. I'm quoting Facts of Perception. Helmholtz says, Our sensations are precisely effects produced by external causes in our organs. Our sensation can pass for a sign, but not for an image. For one requires from an image some sort of similarity with the object image. A sign, however, need not have any type of similarity with what it is assigned for. The relations between the two are so restricted that the same object taking effect under equal circumstances produces the same sign. And hence, unequal signs always correspond to unequal effects. I think this corresponds pretty much with what I said was the point of the card concerning ideology, sensation, and perception. Now, concerning part three of the paper, it is not clear to me how Helmholtz really plays a role in the alphabet. Now, he's never mentioned there. Right. Footnote 28 of the paper suggests as evidence of the relevance of Helmholtz, paragraphs 57 to 64 of the alphabet. But only Wundt is mentioned there. And this fact does not seem to be very important. First, because Helmholtz himself is not mentioned. And second, because the passage only suggests that Carnap read Wundt. In fact, he refers to Wundt's kind of reduction of the psychological to the physical as, I quote, based upon the almost altogether unknown psychophysical relation. So Carnap is not really defending this kind of reduction. He shows more sympathy for a behaviorist view, which he calls materialistic, in paragraphs 57, 59 of the Alpha. And a particular interesting, perhaps, is also what he says in the Alte und die Neue Logik. This fact fits very well with the Alpha, this criticism of Carnap and his partial agreement with behaviorism, since the behavior of 
of other people grounded in the expression relation allows him to construct the heteropsychological from the autopsychological. The psychological, <clears throat> will, the, sorry, the psychophysical relation will be interesting according to Carnap if it was proved for it will be a better way to articulate the construction of the heteropsychological. However, it is precisely because the conjecture is not more than a conjecture that he needs to work with the expression relation, which is simply a relation um, that connects the, what people express with the uh, with, with what they express in their bodies with the supposedly the autopsychological of each of those individuals or subjects. <clears throat> I think the, the claimed influence of Helmut on, on Carnap is also open to objections because Carnap, when discussing tone experience, does not mention Helmholtz, actually. This is a problem for arguably auditory experience was perhaps the most important part of Helmholtz's work, or certainly one of the central parts of his work. It could well be that Carnap had other more important sources instead of Helmholtz. So I will exemplify this with a different issue <clears throat> related to vision. Some of the realistic descriptions of vision in paragraph 127, particularly when, when, when Carnap talks about the stereoscopic vision, could be attributed perhaps to Helmholtz, although his name is not mentioned. However, more likely the information came from Mach's contributions to the analysis of sensations, where the same information is presented. Because there are several possible sources and because Helmholtz is not mentioned, it seems very difficult to make the link that Patton suggests, particularly with Helmholtz and the alpha. It seems that the psychology relevant for the project of the alpha is rather Gestalt psychology, because the whole project agrees with the view that evidence in science is ultimately personal experience. And this is, of course, the crucial point with Carnap's, uh, in between uh, Carnap and Quine. Now, concerning 19th century science, I wonder how is Gestalt psychology related to the work of Helmholtz and other scientists who investigated the physiology of vision in the 19th century. Is there a physiology of Gestalt? Is there a physiological fact that suggests the choice of elementary experiences instead of atomic sensations as the basis for construction? There are also interesting questions too, like I think Carnap's Aufbau might not be exactly following this top psychology in many relevant uh, issues, actually. But anyway, so the question is, what is the connection then between Gestalt and 19th century um, science that is shown in the paper to be the background of the alpha? I have some questions also concerning the notion of subject. It is argued that for naturalism, the subject I quote, the subject not only is part of nature, but her beliefs and knowledge depend on nature and, her, and, and on her engagement with it. <clears throat> now, the subjective basis that Carnap uses for the construction of the role, as Carnap says, the given as it is, does not contain a subject of any sort, of course. According to Carnap, the epistemological subject and the empirical subject are constructed simultaneously at a later stage, namely in the intermediate state between the auto and the heteropsychological. In Patton's view, the constitution of the subject is part of naturalism. But are the epistemic and the empirical subject really naturalist constructions in the alphabet? What troubles me is that the epistemic subject in the alpha would be the subject connected with what Carnap calls the given as it is. But the given as it is does not have a subject. 
Now, of course, kind of moves from the scare quotes in my, in my experience to uncoated my experiences by means of the construction of what he calls my body, right? The body seems to be the only principle of individuation of a person. Now, I wonder, could we perhaps say that this is the metaphysical idea that he shares with 19th century science. The, individu the only, I mean, the idea that the only principle of individuation of a person is the body. Since this is suggested by the way Kahn constructs the intersubjective role based on his body, etc. Lastly, uh, I'm not sure about the use of objectivity and subjectivity in the paper. So Patton assumes that the relevance of the constitution of the subject for Carnap is related to objectivity and intersubjectivity. While I do not dispute the general point, I think that one must keep in mind that what guarantees objectivity and intersubjectivity for Carnap is neither physiology nor the interaction of subjects, but the possibility of sharing structures. Only structures, as it is the case for Schlick and also for Russell actually, only structures are shareable for personal experience, the basis of construction, the material to which we apply structure is completely private, different for each person. And Carnap makes the point that it is impossible to know other people's experiences. So there is this commitment to privacy and a commitment to shareable objective structures. It seems that other people are relevant for objectivity and intersubjectivity only to the extent that they understand mathematics and logic, which of course grounds the, 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 the logical structures that are shareable. As science itself is um, an example of this. So physics is just formal or just structural as logic and mathematics, and this is what allows us to communicate and is the ground for objectivity in the car. So what one doesn't see clearly is how uh, Patton views this point since uh, Patton goes to uh, discuss different subjects in the construction as a foundation for objectivity. But the real argument for objectivity seems to be just shareable structures. So these are my, my comments. Thanks. So, Lydia, if you want, you can respond it. Sure. Um, well, I'm not sure I can, but I will try. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I I now wish that we could have another talk where you uh, say more about these uh, thoughts, but thank you, Dr. Engelmann. Um, so, I want to say a couple of things um, in, in responding, and these will have to be fairly... Um, quick because I, I, well, fairly quickly constructed um, because like everyone, I've, I've just heard these just now. Um, so the first point that I want to make is that this is probably something that, um, it, this is definitely something that's a failure in the paper um, because I'm trying to construct a um, historical narrative about what's happening with discussions of naturalism as we move from the 19th to the 20th century. And that is of course a, an incredibly complicated topic. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to do in relating these different um, stages in the paper is to talk about what we mean by naturalism, what are the different things that we could mean by naturalism. And um, one historical point that I really, I'm grateful to your, to your comments for, um, for helping me to say more about and to, and to clarify for myself, and I'm going to have to think about this um, in revising the paper, 
is that a historical point that I didn't theorize enough in the paper is that you can be important to the development of a philosophical tradition or idea without yourself being someone about who, to whom that philosophical concept or idea applies, right? So in particular, I think that there are people in traditions like logical empiricism is clearly important to the development of the idea of naturalism in philosophy. But as I say, there are some logical empiricists who were naturalists and some who were not, but they nonetheless contributed to the historical development of that uh, strain within philosophy. And I think that it's, it's important to note that. Um, it's also important to note, so, so um, I, I held back in this version of the paper, and this is somewhat unfair because a version that was sent earlier to Dr. Engelmann, I was, I was much less um, circumspect about this, right? But I held back from saying the following thing in the paper, and I did say it in earlier versions of the paper. I'm gonna come clean here. I did say, look, if you define naturalism in the following way, right? If you simply say, as is a common definition of naturalism, that the methods of philosophy should be continuous with the methods of the sciences, that what we can say about things is what science can say. Um, if you make these kind of facile associations that people make between philosophical naturalism and having a scientific theory um, of the subject and of her place in the world, then According to those principles, Carnap would count as a naturalist. Some other people would not count as naturalists. Um, you know, and and so it it almost <laughs> um, is a joke, right? That there are so many definitions of naturalism, and and I feel like uh, Dr. Engelmann's uh, presentation brought this out extremely well. There are some of the definitions of naturalism that I discussed that would rule out Ryle and Schlick and others um, that would rule out uh, Mach as a naturalist or James or whatever, right? And um, depending on your philosophical commitments, that can sound ridiculous, right? Like, well, it can't be true that, you know, this person is not a naturalist or that this person is a naturalist because, and then you list your associations with what naturalism is. Well, precisely my point is that um, we need to be much more careful about what we mean by naturalism, right? And I do too, and this paper, you know, is certainly not clear enough. Like I'm, I'm trying to get started to clarify what I mean. Um, but I think that that was really my ultimate point is that um, depending on what you mean by naturalism, there are these ridiculous seeming judgments that can be made about so-and-so or so-and-so being a naturalist that are just just seem obviously wrong, but then it turns out that when you clarify what you mean um, by naturalist, different you, you cut things in different directions and different things be true. But the second point that I really do wanna make is this historical point that I think I, I really, so, so I'm not going to double down on, on thinking that any one particular person is naturalist or not, I, because I think that it's such a slippery concept. However, I think that there is a concept of naturalism that became important in philosophy. And I think that there's no question that Carnap's work, um, Schlick's work, work of a lot of other people who I'm not sure I would call naturalist, contributed to that discussion, contributed to those debates, right? To what we mean by um, naturalist philosophy or anti-naturalist philosophy, right? So um, I definitely, I will say that right now, I do not think that Carnap was a naturalist. I think that's clearly false. <laughs> um, I think that it's a slippery concept and depending on how you divide it up, there are ways that you could be led in that direction. And that was kind of the, again, it was kind of a, it was a joke that nobody got that I was like, well, look, if you put it this way, then this person turns out as a natural, you know, and it's, I should stop making bad jokes basically. Um, so, but, so in that sense, I, I totally agree um, that the discussion of the paper um, really does lead to, and I think I really do, do think that, I do wanna again, sort of still maintain this, 
the discussion of the paper does support the idea that depending on your definition of naturalism, different figures are going to turn out to be naturalists who we might or might not think that that's uh, reasonable about. I think we need to think a lot more about that. I think it's, it's really important. Um, I want to get to some of the other points, but before I go on from that, I want to say something quickly about this. I think there's also a kind of dominant narrative that we need to really think through which is these debates between Chalmer, and this is not this is not um, directly relevant to this paper, but I think it's it's sort of a a shadow hovering in the background, right? There are these debates between like Chalmers and Dennett and Churchland and Jackson about what's physicalism, what's naturalism about the mind. Um, this discussions that have to do with Gilbert Ryle about Cartesianism and so forth. And I think that a lot of times, one thing that happens is that we take these notions, like what does Frank Jackson mean by physicalism? And we project them back in history. And um, I think that that's bad. And I think one of the, one of the um, it, it obscures a lot of the much more interesting, well, a lot of the very interesting stuff that was happening um, in the 19th and 20th centuries, like 20th century definitions of physicalism and debates about physicalism should not be restricted to, to what um, 21st and late 20th century debates uh, would have that term mean. Um, so I think in the case of physicalism and naturalism especially, this paper is an initial sort of clumsy attempt to clarify like what was actually meant by these terms in these, uh, in, in these contexts. And one of the first things that um, I think you figure out when you start looking into this is that they meant a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts and it's um, and I have a lot of work to do and others have a lot of work to do in kind of figuring out exactly what is meant. So I'm very grateful for these uh, comments that I've written down carefully because I think that they'll be helpful in, in thinking this through. So I do wanna say, I don't think Carnap was a naturalist. I think that what Carnap had to say contributed to debates about it and, and that I do think is true. Um, okay, the Cartesian, uh, the Cartesian point, I surrender completely on that point, right? Like I, so so, on the following point, I think it's I I love the connection between Descartes' sign theory and Helmholtz's sign theory. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think that um, the quote that 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 you read out uh, from Helmholtz um, about signs not having any more uh, connection with uh, their objects than the the the. Uh, regularities, um, the order in time. He says various things about this in different places. Um, that's one of, uh, I think that that's absolutely um, Helmholtz's position. He holds it for a long period in his, in his career and I, I have no objection to that. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit uh, pedantic. I never said the word Descartes <laughs> or Cartesian. So that's, I mean, it's, that's a little, I'm, I'm literally splitting hairs here, right? But it's, it's true, right? I said mind body distinction. Uh, in the footnote, the, the, the card appears. Oh, sorry. fair enough, fair enough in the footnote in the actual. I, I read all the footnotes. <laughs> oh, I mean, there were a lot of footnotes. So I am, I am, uh, okay. Well, I'm not going to find the footnote because I w don't want everyone to be here all day, but um, I think, Okay, so I mentioned Descartes in a footnote, but I, and I'll, I'll find it and see whether I need to change that, and maybe I do. Um, but I think that what I didn't, I didn't really mean when I talk about the mind-body division, I didn't really mean exactly what like Ryle would call Cartesian dualism, right? So, and you know a lot more about that than I do, but um, what, I, what I meant to be talking about, and this is going to get into the third point that I wanna make, um, what I meant to bring up is the um, the notion that there is somehow a separate science of psychology that um, deals with the sort of voluntary actions of the mind and that it is essentially different from um, the deliverances of the sensory of the sensorium and of and of the body. And I agree that Descartes, him, that, that that distinction is actually difficult to draw in Descartes' case. Um, 
And I, but one of the things that I want to, that I want to, to argue is that that distinction in 19th century um, physiology of perception and psychology, and as a result, epistemology or Kentness theory, right, um, is not um, drawn in the same way that we might assume that it is. Um, so there isn't this, this assumption in particular that there is a kind of ground level of, um, you know, sensory deliverances that then get worked up um, using inference, but that inference is somehow fundamentally different from perception. Um, and so that I think is the, the, the idea that there's a sort of sensory level and then there's an inferential level and that inferences are not operative in perception, they're only operative in thinking where thinking is conceived as different from perception. I think that's what this 19th century tradition um, really wants to talk about. And that leads to, um, but that leads to a couple of interesting points. Um, so one is I, so I wanna be very careful here, like very clearly the way that this paper is put together, it, um, it implies that what I'm saying is that Helmholtz was a was a significant influence on the Aufbau, and I I need to change that because that's not really what I want to say. And you've you've totally obliterated any you know like that. I I, I you know um, if I had a little here a white flag right. Um, that's <laughs> I agree that's totally wrong. But but. Um, and again, this is going to be a, sound a little pedantic, but but note that I have literally waved a white flag before I said this, right? Um, what I what I said is that these questions come up in the 19th and early 20th century tradition of physiology of perception and psychology, and that those questions are in the background of what's going on in the Aufbau, right? And I think that that distinction is important because I don't, and I, and I here again, I'm being pedantic. I did, I did actually say, I, I'm not saying that Helmholtz and Fechner and Wundt were an influence on the Aufbau directly, but I will say like, so you pointed out that, you know, um, it's much more likely that Mach, for instance, was a, was a, and clearly Gestalt psychology, there's no question that Gestalt psychology was much more important. But I want to point out that there is no there is no world in which Mach and Helmholtz are unrelated, right? Um, so saying, well, Carnap got this question from Mach um, and not from Helmholtz. Well, but Mach was influenced by Helmholtz, right? Everybody was influenced by Helmholtz in that in that uh, tradition um, in phys uh, psychology and physiology, and so. Um, my, my goal is just to point out that these questions about the role of physiology and psychology in perception, and also these questions about subjectivity and objectivity, which is going to be the last thing I'm going to uh, talk about, um, become really crucial. And I think that they are crucial uh, background, at least, um, to the projects that are happening, uh, to, to the Alphabet project and other projects that are happening in this tradition. So that's really the point that I want to make. Um, but you you brought up an an, uh, an issue about subjectivity and objectivity that I really want to clarify because I think this is a really important point. Um, so this the point that you made about uh, shared structures uh, in the Aufbau and that and and the earlier points that you made about um, there being this sort of uh, elementar Leibnizsa and then the re re uh, recollections of similarity um, and the role of type theory and so forth. I, I totally agree with, with all of that. Um, my, my, the point that I want to, to make um, is really that there's a fundamental question uh, about um, the, the role of objectivity as opposed to the role of subjectivity and um, one of the points that, that you made in the, in the comments um, is that, well, look, you know, for, for Carnap and the Aufbau, it seems like there really isn't, um, and, and this I think is, is what's kind of behind Quine's point too, it's like, it's not as if there's a subject 
of knowledge, like there's a subject of knowledge, it's that there's these shared structures of objectivity. And so there's, there's intersubjectivity where we can share. Um, and the subject is in a sense, you know, there's these sort of solipsistic experiences. But, and, and here's where I do wanna say like, just, just give me just a small window here, right? Um, that's, that's kind of the point I was making about Helmholtz. Um, and about this, again, about this tradition in, in 19th century psychology is that precisely the idea um, that we can explain something about the subject of knowledge and that that's going to be um, distinct from sort of these structures and inferences of objectivity, that there's gonna be like a ground level subjective experience that's maybe just sensory experiences in the world. And then we come afterwards and kind of impose objective structures. That's not how um, 19th century uh, researchers in physiology and psychology saw it either. Um, and, and this is, I need, to, I need to say a lot more about this, but this is really in a way the central idea that I want to, to argue for is that there was a kind of fundamental questioning of the way that subjectivity and objectivity are uh, sort of co-constituted that I see as being consistent between um, the, the Aufbau project and the project um, that Helmholtz and others had. Um, I don't want to argue that there was necessarily a direct influence, but I want to say that there's an interesting idea that can be found in both of these uh, cases. I will admit that it is not uh, fleshed out enough, um, but in a way I think that um, it's, it's an idea that hasn't necessarily been, I, I haven't found it in other work yet, so I really want, I, I think that there's something to it and I really want to invest at least some time in it and see if there's anything to it. Um, and so I think that uh, in that sense, um, what I really want to say in this paper, and um, I think we're coming to the end of the time though, is what I really want to say in this paper is that um, there was a questioning of, um, in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was a questioning of some of the, um, there, there was a way of dealing with the subject subjectivity and objectivity distinction um, that I think is not exactly the same, but is related in the Erkentness theory tradition and in the uh, in certain um, debates over logical empiricism, quine, naturalism, and so forth. And that I think, um, you know, obviously I need to be more careful about how I defend it, um, but I think there is something interesting there about um, how that comes to be uh, constituted and how it comes to be debated. Um, so I should say more about that, but maybe I can't today. <laughs> So, Mauro, do you want to reply? Or? Um, we have a little bit of time, so uh, you can if you want. Now, there, there is something I suggested, and I don't know if uh, perhaps you, you, you wouldn't mind, I would like to hear it. Is that uh, about so it's I, I talked a little bit about this metaphysical assumption of the individuation of the subject. Now, uh, are we individuate the subject by means of the body, and it seems that it's uh, a metaphysical step presupposed. In I'm calling this metaphysical uh, simply because, uh, well, I mean one one could think of different ways to to individuate the body, which is, well, sorry, the subject, which is not the body. And if if you accept that what individuates the subject is the body, then the construction of the alcohol makes sense. If, I mean, if, if it makes sense to say that I'm now observing my body and seeing that my body is this part of the subjectless uh, subject, <laughs> the subjectless basic in, uh, with which I begin the project of construction and so on. And it seems that this, uh, I would say, metaphysical assumption is is pretty much taken 
for granted in the 19th century. I don't know. I, this is more a curiosity since you you know you, you have been through this material uh, with a lot of care. I, I don't know. I, it's, I just would like to know if you see this idea, not, not that someone m makes an explicit statement, of course, but perhaps perhaps some someone says exactly like that like what individuate the subject is the body or something but <clears throat> i don't know if, if you if you have something to to add on that oh yeah the, no this is um and of course the this is the the exciting and also the the risky thing about uh, about you know discussions is that i might say something that turns out to be completely wrong right but um that's an excellent uh question and i think um, this is making me think about the fact that um, in this, one of the things that makes, and I, I think this is one reason why there hasn't, you know, there has been uh, work on this topic, but but not maybe in, on this exact question that you're bringing up, I think. Um, and one reason that this is so complicated is that in the physiological and psychological tradition, um, there are a number of words for the self or the um, the mind or the you know and that and these can be considered as sort of um, individuating people, right? So um, I'm I'm thinking about, for instance, that the word in French is am, right? And when they used to talk about how many people there were in a, and, and you still say this in French, right? Um, when you talk about how many people there are in a city, you say there are so many souls in the city, right? You say there are 40,000 um, in, in you know, a village or something like that. And in German, you say Zähle. Um, and so you can talk about um, the, and, and so there was a sense, and this is not at all the sense um, that you're talking about. Um, you can talk about this sort of theological or actually metaphysical sense of the soul, um, the uh, suke, the, the zela, the am, um, right, as, as being um, something that individuates a particular being, right? So I am my soul, right? I'm not my body, I'm my soul. What is really fascinating, and I have a lot of work on this, but almost none of this was in this paper, is that in the 19th century tradition that I'm talking about, and then in a whole set of other uh, um, thinkers during this time, the words, those words were divested almost entirely of their metaphysical content. So, um, when you talked about a Zela in, in the physiological research in Germany, you meant a physical thing. They were trying to find the physical seat of the, of the soul so that all of the activities that had previously been attributed to, you know, a, a sort of metaphysical theological soul were then attributed instead to nerves and, um, the brain and to physiological processes happening in the body. And this is something that you find in Helmholtz, you find it in Pfluger, you find it in, um, there's a number of other people. And at first, what you have is this idea that, well, we're going to take these theological ideas of a soul as the individuation of, an, of a person, and we're going to try to find their, their material or physiological substrate. And then when you get to Helmholtz's group of people and, and um, people like Emile Dubois-Raymond and others, and, and there have been talks about this in this, in this very series of talks this week, um, you get people saying, well, wait a minute, um, maybe we're not looking for the physical correlate of, of the theological soul. Maybe the material stuff that we can investigate using the physiology of perception just is the soul, what we pre previously, um, and we can ascribe sort of all of the processes and, um, and, and, and activities and abilities and inferences and so forth to the physical, physiological thing that we used to ascribe to the metaphysical soul. 
And so um, in, in that sense, there would be a correlation um, because that is exactly the sort of central drama of a lot of what's happening in, in late 19th and early 20th century physiology is that the soul is becoming D uh, is becoming material. It's becoming, um, it's being removed from the metaphysical realm, the theological realm and moving into the material realm. Um, and I'm scared to use the word naturalism now, but I think that that's, um, <laughs> nonetheless, you know, there's, there's sort of a, um, there's, there's definitely um, a move towards materialism, right? Where you say uh, what we previously attributed to an immaterial substance is now something that we can show using the empirical experimental um, methods of physiology of perception, we can show that this can be done by um, the body, right? All of these processes that we had previously attributed to the soul. And literally the same word, um, although in German, of course, there are a million of them, right? Suka, Zela, Geist, right? Um, but all of those words get sort of moved into um, being identified with the body. And so I don't, I don't have anything. Um, I'm, I, I think that it would be a very interesting project to look into, but I have not done this whether people used um, this reasoning about the body to argue that in the same, the, the material basis for, for theorizing about the soul, to argue that the body's um, processes and so forth individuate people, individuate human beings in the same way that the soul was previously thought to individuate them. And I, I think that's plausible because they attributed all of the functions of, of the, the, the metaphysical soul to the physical body. But I, I don't know of specific places where that happens. Thank you. So uh, before uh, getting in the, into the closing of the event, uh, we had an organized for receiving remarks, comments, and questions from the public. But since uh, Chiara Russo Kraus uh, made a comment on the debate of both both of you, I'll project it here, and if you want, you can comment on it. Okay. So there are two remarks actually. So the first is here. Yeah, you can comment if you want it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I think, but I think that um, I, I I appreciate that, and I think that that you know, Helmholtz was an incredibly important figure. Um, I think, to be fair, I still owe an account of exactly how, and in what exact way, um, that influence took place. And I think that the comments were excellent in explaining precisely where I need to, to, to sort of say more, especially in this discussion of subjectivity and objectivity, but I'm, I'm grateful for the comment. So the second one is this. <laughs> uh... <laughs> oh, it's just me, let me come. This makes I scholarship mean, a very, very easy job now. <laughs> yes, <that's>, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that, uh, uh, yeah, this, this, let me think of some more people. No, but I think, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I do think that Helmholtz is honestly the only person you could make an argument like this for, but, but it, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that that's going to honestly end up being like, look, Helmholtz was sort of an eminence grise behind a whole bunch of these debates, and we need to figure out exactly though the 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 scholarly meat to it though is how right exactly how did this work? If I want to argue, you know, I I owe an argument for exactly how this works. So, but I 
Yeah. I agree, though. I think there's a lot of debates in 19th and early 20th century that Helmholtz is kind of lurking in the background and, and people don't say um, because these debates were so fundamental. But that's such a it's such a hard historical argument to make, you know, that like these people were so important that you didn't even need to bother. Um, but I think like there are cases like Lord Raleigh's uh, theories of sound book where the influence is incredibly evident and he doesn't cite Helmholtz and there it's actually like, it's an interesting point that he doesn't cite Helmholtz when Helmholtz is so obviously relevant, um, but yeah. So she, she further commented on what you said. Right. Totally agree. Of course. Thank you. So I think that's it, right? I would like to thank you, Lydia, and thank you, Mauro, for being here and accepting our invitation. The presentation was great and also the debate. Well, now we come to the closing of this meeting. Uh, in the name of our research group, I would like, first of all, to thank all the participants of the event, both keynote speakers and debaters. Secondly, I want to mention Brenda Soares, Lucas Amaral, Lucas Bacará, and other members of our research group who helped organizing this event. And lastly, I would like to thank all the viewers who joined us throughout the week. Although the event was held in an online version, I hope everyone could enjoy and learn from it as much as I did, for instance. Hopefully, in the near future, uh, we can all have the opportunity to meet each other in person at PUC SP, PUC São Paulo. Uh, thank you all. It was a great week, and I hope we can see each other in the near future. Bye-bye. Thank you.